first of all, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for coming to the Seed Library Seed Saving and Harvesting Program. Uh, my name is Olivia Truesdale. I'm a college student in Southern California working with the Seed Library uh, through a grant from my school this summer to offer some virtual programming. I'm born and raised in Rochester, so it's nice to be home working with the library again. And I'd like to first uh, welcome our two presenters, Heidi Cass and Kelly Ray Kilpatrick. Heidi was born and raised in Rochester and has a lifelong love of plants and gardening. She has a bachelor's degree in biology, but is mostly self-taught in gardening, permaculture, and urban, urban homesteading. Heidi is the founder and organizer of the Backyard Bounty Urban Homesteading Meetup Group in Rochester, which currently has almost 170 members. Heidi is also one of the co-founders of the Rochester Seed Library, which she, which she was motivated to start to encourage people to use their space to grow inexpensive and healthy food. Heidi has taught a variety of gardening classes for the Seed Library and also for community education. And Kelly created the Plant a Seed Initiative to inspire a better understanding of our food system. As a conductor, she synthesizes ideas and brings sustainable projects into clear focus for implementation. Because of her capacity to build partnerships, the work she does is both broad and deep. Kelly works with partners to create community food gardens that address local security issues. Co-founder of the Seed Library at the Rochester Public Library, this overwhelmingly successful program has already checked out 11,500 seed packets in its second season. And there are still more, you guys. Go ahead and reserve those. Um, by envisioning how various components of a system work together, Kelly leads in both expected and unexpected ways to increase community resiliency. So a uh, big round of applause for our presenters today. And um, when you guys are ready, go ahead and share your presentation and go ahead and start. Thank you for joining us. So welcome everybody. Um, this is a seed saving presentation that we have um, put together. Heidi and I have um, taught this workshop a couple of times. Uh, we actually started our seed library uh, before we opened it with uh, seed saving examples and a workshop in 2018 to kind of get the community um, excited about this whole process. Olivia, can you advance the slide please? So there's many reasons why we should save seeds. Um, a, a lot of us understand um, that it's more economical to save seeds. We wouldn't have to purchase um, purchase anything if we're saving our own seeds. We're able to provide for a greater gen genetic diversity when we when we save our seeds as those seeds acclimate to our climate. Um, we also can build community while we're saving our seeds, and. Um, the seeds are always available for you and it's fun. It helps you to reduce um, food insecurities and um, we're able to uh, work through um, economic differences by, uh, by growing our own seeds as well. So next slide, please. One of the... Um, Greatest uh, things you need to know when you're saving your own seeds is that you should really know your plants. Growing something that you're really familiar with is a good way to start, but open pollinated uh, seeds are what you're going to want to plant. You're going to want to grow open pollinated varieties versus hybrid or F1 varieties. Sometimes open pollinated varieties can be heirlooms. Heirlooms is just a term that uh, kind of refers to an older seed that's been passed down from generation to generation, such as, you know, you getting your grandmother's quilt, or perhaps you wore your mother's wedding dress, or, you know, a treasured piece of furniture that's been handed down through generations. That's really what an heirloom seed is, but heirloom seeds are open pollinated seeds. And those are the ones that we recommend that you save seeds from. Uh, those are the seeds that you'll want to save because they come true to type and plant hybrids. You're just never quite sure what you're going to get. So are the seeds that we're going to be saving annuals, biennials or perennials? In most cases, the easiest seeds to save are going to be from your annu annuals. And those are seeds that grow up and form a seed in their first growing season. Whereas a biennial, such as a carrot or onion, they need to overwinter. So they're gonna grow their first season in your garden. You may dig them up, store them in sand, store them in the bottom of your refrigerator or a root cellar. And then in the spring, you'll replant them because they're gonna form, finish their life cycle and produce a seed that second year. Perennials come back year after year, but they also set seeds each and every season and they don't stop their life cycle after they set their seeds. So next slide, please, Olivia. 
Oh, wait, could we hold on one second? Yep. Get back, Olivia. I just wanted to um, tell the story about this crazy white uh, thing that's growing on this vine in, in this picture. This is an actual picture from my yard this year, and I had some squash plants that started to grow out of my compost pile. And that's not unusual at all. Um, if you're composting your kitchen scraps, um, many times the seeds will um, absolutely love the compost pile and will grow well in it. And so I decided to do a little experiment and transplant that little seedling that was coming out of the compost into a pot and see what would grow, hoping to get something recognizable, something that we could eat. And as the plant grew, um, this is what came on that plant. This is a perfect example of what happens when you take a store-bought squash, probably a store-bought acorn squash, and save those seeds and then plant them the next year. Um, it appears to me that what happened here is that the acorn squash from the store was a hybrid variety. And those seeds are not going to grow to be the same as their parent plant. So this is a perfect example. I don't know what was crossed to produce the hybrid um, that we ate and then you know put the remains of into the compost but um, this is this is what i got and uh, we will be growing this and then tasting it to see what it is but um certainly not what i expected so just a perfect example for you to see uh, what can happen if you are are planting those seeds that come from a hybrid plant okay next slide thank you So what we're talking about when we're forming seeds is the pollination process in plants. Flowers are generally usually always necessary for forming, um, for forming fruits. There is one cucumber variety that sets fruit without any flowers and they're kind of used in the trade um, by growers because you don't need to have pollination. So they're great in hoop houses where you don't necessarily get a lot of insect pollination. But for our purposes, we are all about the flowers on a plant. So the flowers are the important part because they contain the pollen that fertilizes the female parts of the flower and then fruit forms from that. And we all know what's inside of fruit and that's seeds. And that's what we're all about. So there's three types of pollination. We have self-pollinating flowers, there's wind pollinated flowers, and there are insect pollinated flowers. And here's three examples you see on your screen. And um, these are what we're gonna be talking about today. So next slide, please, Olivia. We talked about getting seeds that are true to type, and that's why we use open pollinated versus hybrids. But what can happen with any pollen is that cross pollination, uh, wind drift from pollen from in someone else's yard or across another field, insects from your uh, acorn squash over in one corner of your yard can bring pollen over to your pumpkin or to your zucchini, and you're gonna have outcrossing. So, what happens with cross pollination is that it kind of mucks up the variety. You end up with something very different when you plant those seeds out the following following year. So we want to make sure we control that pollination and this can only occur um, within the same species. I recommend I, I just mentioned acorn squash pumpkins and then zucchinis. Those are all cucurbita pipo. And PIPO is the species name here that we're referring to in, in that particular specific epithet, the, the species of cucurbita PIPO. And it's the PIPO that we need to pay attention to because pollen between any of those plants can cross pollinate and not affecting the fruit this year, but affecting the seeds and the fruit that will come once you plant those seeds. So fruit that's formed in that cross pollination process will be fine. It's the seeds that are planted that cause the different fruit to occur, which is what Heidi just mentioned in that potted sort of white pumpkin you saw on the on the picture previously. That was a seed that had grown from something that she had eaten earlier and it grew. So we don't have anything that we can readily identify. Heirloom and pollinated varieties um, have been prevented from cross pollinating in their production process so they remain true to type and that's why we kind of control the pollination process next slide 
So your mission as a gardener, if you want to save seeds for yourself, because you love that watermelon you ate this summer and you just absolutely want to be able to grow it again, or if you want to donate seeds to our seed library, your mission is to maintain those specific traits of the plants and the fruits that you are growing, because we want to be able to keep doing it year after year after year. Next slide. Okay, so um, I would suggest that if you are brand new to seed saving, and if there's nothing else that you remember from today's presentation, try to remember this slide. These are the easy four. Um, these are the plants that are self pollinating and they're annuals. So what that means is that this plant is going to be planted from a seed at the beginning of the year and grow all the way to a seed saving product at the end of the year. And they're self pollinating, meaning you don't have to worry very much about the possibility of cross pollination. Uh, we, we rate these as easy and you'll see as we go along in our presentation that we occasionally throw in a rating and it might be easy. It might be um, easy with precautions or it might be challenging. That kind of gives you an idea of uh, whether or not you want to attempt to save seeds from those plants. So the ones that we consider um, the easiest here are beans, lettuce, peas and tomatoes. Um, these can be any kind of a common bean, any kind of lettuce, um, any kind of pea, or any kind of, well, almost any kind of tomato. There is actually uh, what's called a current tomato that is a separate species. Um, and that also is easy to save, I, I suppose, as well. But um, so these are very easy. You just basically let that plant mature all the way to through its life cycle. Um, for lettuce, most people probably haven't seen what that looks like, um, but instead of pulling the lettuce out of the ground when it starts to bolt and get sort of bitter in flavor, you're just going to leave that plant in the garden and allow the flower stock to grow and eventually produce flowers and then seeds. So it's, it's just really a matter of, of almost neglecting the plants, letting them stay in the garden, letting them fulfill their life cycle, and then collecting the seeds at the end. Um, the same for the beans and the peas. Very, very simple to collect the seeds. For tomatoes, there is a little bit of a trick to collecting seeds, and we're going to cover that towards the end of the PowerPoint today. Um, the only real concern, if, if there is any at all, with collecting seeds from these four types of plants is that if you have room in your garden and you can, uh, try to give them a little bit of space between the different varieties. So if you're growing two different kinds of peas, if you can separate those by eight to 10 feet in your garden, you're really going to absolutely ensure that, that they're going to be true to type and that there's no crossing. Um, but these are pretty much foolproof. So if you don't have that kind of space, um, I think it's still well worth saving the seed. Okay, next slide. There are also self-pollinating vegetables that have a more open flower. And because of that, they do attract insects. And those insects can cause problems with cross-pollination. So examples of that would be things in the pepper group, the eggplants, ground cherries, okra. There are a few others. Um, but these are plants that are able to pollinate themselves. So they don't require insects, but many times insects can be um, in the mix and, and causing cross-pollination. So one way to ensure that you're going to have true seed if you're growing these plants is to isolate those flower buds before they open. That can be done by um, isolating the cluster of flowers themselves or by putting a bag over the entire plant, which is what you see in that first picture there. Before the plant has any open flowers, you would bag it um, in some kind of a bag that allows air uh, to get through and also light. Um, and then after the flowers have opened and they've self-pollinated and fruits have started to form, you can remove that bag and then tie a piece of yarn or a piece of ribbon around those fruits because you'll know that those fruits were completely free from any um, cross-pollination by insects. And those are the ones you're going to want to save the seeds from at the end of the season. 
Now the bag that you see there is um, actually what they call a lettuce bag. Uh, at least that's what I call it. I think that's what they call it um, at the Feed Savers Exchange website as well. So you can order them there and they come in a pack of six, I believe. Um, very handy for seed saving in multiple different kinds of vegetables. Um, and then on the, the picture on the right, you can see there a pepper that has been tied with a white piece of yarn so that it stands out. And when we pick that one eventually to eat it after it's completely ripe, we'll remember to save the seeds from that particular pepper. Okay, next slide. A couple of examples of vegetables that are wind pollinated um, include spinach, which um, may be a surprise to some people, corn, which I think most people recognize, and also beets and Swiss chard, which are the same species of plant. Um, corn, you can, you can certainly um, prevent cross-pollination and work on seed saving in corn. It does require a little bit more training and um, dedication, and you need some specific supplies in order to isolate both the male and female flowers. Because we have so much corn in our, in our community, both in the farm fields and community gardens and in other people's gardens, it's, it's a challenge to make sure that corn is not cross-pollinated. So I'm not, we're not really gonna go into a lot of detail about that. Um, so I'm gonna focus really on spinach because that is one plant that's very easy to grow. A lot of people like to grow spinach and it's an easy one to save seed from as long as you're pretty confident that you don't have any nearby neighbors doing the same thing. Um, you might have neighbors that are growing spinach, but as long as they're not letting that spinach go to seed and pollinate, you're probably safe doing it yourself. And all you really need to do is to allow a group of plants, say five to 10 plants, um, finish growing in your garden. Now, spinach is interesting because some of the plants are male and some of the plants are female, and you won't be able to tell which is which until they start to mature. So the picture here on the top is a female spinach plant, and those little white filaments are part of the female flower. And when the pollen is carried through the wind, then they attach to those filaments and they um, fertilize and create seed. And Olivia, if you could go to the next slide, I have a more up close picture of what that looks like. Um, so if you can see right at the base of the leaf stems, the little clusters, they look like little balls and each there's like a cluster of seeds there. These are very, very immature seeds. Eventually this plant will dry and turn brown and so will those seeds. And when it's completely dry and brown, those seeds are mature and ready to be harvested from your spinach. Next slide. So many garden plants are insect pollinated and this is a more challenging group of plants to save seed from um, because insects are hard to control. They will do their thing and work very hard and very fast and move around your garden and spread all kinds of pollen between all kinds of plants. Um, some of the groups of plants where this applies are the summer and winter squashes, the melons and cucumbers, which all have that wide open yellow flower. Um, the brassica family, which is all of the, the cabbage type things. So there's broccoli and cabbage and kale and collards, and I've got a whole bunch of them listed there. I've actually separated these into two groups. Some of them are annuals and some of them are biennials. And so if you're interested in saving seed in this family, the easiest ones would be to choose some of those annuals. So bok choy is very easy to save seed from, mustard greens, and some varieties of broccoli as well. Those will produce seed in the first year and don't have to be overwintered. Um, and then there's a few others there listed that are also very easy to save seed from. Um, they are insect pollinated, but generally I would say most people in their own personal gardens are only gonna grow one variety. Uh, you're only gonna grow one type of cilantro or, or one type of arugula generally. So um, you don't really need to worry about cross pollination if you're only growing one variety. Okay, next slide. 
When it comes to the squashes and the melons and the cucumbers, you can actually use hand pollination to ensure that you're getting uh, pollination only within the variety that you're wanting to save seeds from. Um, the very first picture there on the left is an example of a male squash flower that will open the following day, the day after this picture was taken. So I can tell it's a male because the stem is very straight and, and narrow. And the flower is just starting to turn color. And that's an indication that it is probably going to bloom the next day. The second picture here is a female flower. And I can tell that because instead of that green straight stalk behind the flower, we're seeing what is actually an immature fruit right behind the flower. In this case, it looks like it's a yellow squash. So it's kind of yellowish in color and much thicker. Um, and, and it's like a baby squash. And um, the, so that's how you can tell the difference between the male and the female. And what you need to do if you want to hand pollinate and I hope this doesn't sound intimidating because it really is very, very easy. But you need to identify a male and a female flower that will open the following day. And then you need to somehow ensure that those flowers don't open um, to insects. So there are lots of methods. You can try to tape them shut or um, use a, a folded piece of paper with a clothes or a clothespin or a, a paper clip or something. One of the methods that I've found works really well is to use um, these little bags like you see in that lower picture. The larger size bag um, is an organza bag with a drawstring, fits very nicely over most squash blossoms. And so you can bag a male and a female flower the night before, and then the next morning when they're open and receptive to pollination, you would take that male flower Peel away the petals as you're seeing in the picture, and then use all, you know, spread the pollen on the inside of the female flower. And then you're going to rebag that female flower so that no other insects can get into it until a fruit starts to form. So that's just a quick uh, look at how you would do that if you've got uh, multiple varieties. So let's say at your house you're growing zucchini, but you also want to grow pumpkin. As Kelly explained earlier, those are the same species of plant. They're just different varieties. And so they can cross pollinate. So if you want to save seeds from your pumpkin, you'll need to use this hand pollination technique in order to do that. Okay, next slide. I'm just gonna chime in here for a minute, Heidi. Sure. Sometimes people are confused with plants, so I like to use the, the concept of like animal breeding. We're all familiar with different varieties of dogs, German Shepherds, um, uh, Jack Russell Terriers, Scottish Terriers, that kind of thing. Well, they're different varieties of the same species. So to keep those varieties pure, we breed them together, and that's why they're called purebreds. They're not hybrids. They're just a different variety. Because we all know that if we bred a Scottish Terrier with a German Shepherd, we wouldn't end up with anything that looked really much like a German Shepherd or really much like a Scottish Terrier. So if that helps you to kind of reframe this um, vegetable breeding, so to speak, or pollination to ensure that your seeds are true to type, maybe try and think of it that way because it can it puts a very familiar image in your mind as to what we're really doing here. It's no different. Exactly. Thanks. So there are other ways to try to attempt to control pollination, basically. Um, and one of the ways, if you love squash and want to grow multiple types of squash in your garden, but don't really want to worry about doing the hand pollination, uh, but you do want to save seed. So one of the ways you can do that is to grow different species of squash. Um, it's really important when you're choosing your seeds every spring that you know what species of plant you're purchasing. Squash is primarily in three different species and the names of the species are here on the screen. It's really hard to tell by looking. In fact, it's pretty much impossible to tell by looking at the squash what species they're in because they come in all different colors, shapes, and sizes. So you need to know that species name and then if you plant uh, the cucurbita pipo 
the maxima and the muschata in your yard, you can feel confident that those plants are not going to cross pollinate and all of those seeds will be true uh, when you collect them in the fall. Um, because species, as Kelly said, different species cannot cross pollinate. That would be like a dog trying to breed with a cat. That just doesn't work. And that's how it works in the squash as well. So, and that would apply to, you know, any vegetable in the garden. Um, peppers, for example, if you want to save pepper seeds, if you have more than one variety of pepper, you're going to need to do that, that bagging uh, and to ensure that you don't get cross pollination. Okay, next slide. So this is kind of a repeat of what uh, we have said already is that you can cage entire plants as you see on the left there. There are also smaller bags that you can use just to um, secure and, and isolate the, the uh, blossoms of the plant itself. So bag them before they open and then after the fruit sets, um, then you can take the bags off. So this would work with um, those things that we said were self pollinating. Um, but may be interfered with by insects. Next slide. Another way to help is to create um, what I call a pollen buffet. So you've got some kind of a mass planting in between two things that you don't want to get cross. So as the insects, you know, buzz around your zucchini and then want to fly off to, to partake in pollen from something else, they find this giant uh, array of flowers that they're going to stop over at and they're gonna fill up their pouches um, with pollen from the flowers and never make it to the other side of the yard where you might have your pumpkins, for example. Now, this isn't a foolproof method by any means, so I would not rely on it exclusively, but um, it is a good way to not only distract the insects, but also to draw pollinators into your property to really ensure that you've got a good pollen uh, pollination going on in your vegetable crops. Next slide. And one other way to um, think about isolating your varieties is to just grow them in different years, or maybe I should say seed save, seed save in different years. So if you really love radishes and you love all varieties of radishes, you can grow as many varieties of radish as you want at the same time. But I would suggest that you only seed save from one each year. So maybe it's the French breakfast radish that you will allow to stay in your garden and go to seed in the first year. You're going to get just from you know five or six plants, you're gonna get enough seed to last you for years. On the next year, you could uh, do the same thing with another variety of radish. And in that way, by rotating year after year, you can keep your seed stock replenished and um, never have any issues with cross-pollination between your radishes. Next slide. All right, Kelly. So how do you know when a seed is mature and ready to save? Well, We've eaten a lot of them when they're ready, ready to save. And also we wouldn't eat some that are ready to be saved. Corn is an example. No one wants to bite on an ear of really hard and dried out corn, but that's when the seeds are ready, ready to be saved and stored. Looking at these peppers, there's three different um, stages of ripening. We have an unripe pepper, a green pepper, I believe that's a jalapeno. Is that a jalapeno, Heidi? This is actually not my picture, so I Got would. It. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's here's a little here's a little tip for you. Um, truth: all peppers are supposed to be harvested red, unless they're you know they develop to the ripened color of purple or red or orange or yellow. But green peppers are unripe peppers. We should harvest all of our peppers in the red stage. That's when they're ripe and most filled with flavor and most filled with um, the heat, the heat Scoville factor that they're that they're meant to have. So you see three different stages of peppers here. The one in the middle is, is actually the, the ripe seed. So next slide, please. So 
So what that's called is market maturity versus seed maturity. So like I said, um, you can see the picture of the corn on the left. Looks like really yummy sweet corn. We're eating it this time of year. We're buying it at the corn stands. We open it up. Those kernels are fleshy and milky and they just really taste yummy and they're sweet. That fruit is ready to be eaten. And it's, a, it's at the height, height that it's going to um, have the most flavor, but those seeds are not ready. We would want to wait for that corn ear to get completely dried out and be a look like one of those corn stalks that we bring in when we decorate for um, the fall holidays or for Halloween. Um, so that's that's the difference between market maturity and seed maturity. Lettuce, the same thing. Most of us don't see lettuce seeds because we're so busy eating the leaves. It, it's the leaf part of the plant that we eat, not the lettuce seeds. Squash, on the other hand, is actually fairly seed mature when it is market mature. The key for winter squash is that the skin should not dent with your thumbnail. And summer squash, many of us know the zucchini that gets a little out of hand and all of a sudden looks like, you know, a zucchini football or, you know, a zucchini gourd. And we don't wanna eat those because the seeds are just too big, too hard, too thick. Those are when we want to, um, harvest our seeds for a summer squash. And next to the picture of the lettuce, you can see some lettuce plants and the seeds are ripening there. Um, so there's an example of seed maturity versus uh, market maturity on that particular plant. Next slide. So, like I said, you know that the seeds are ready to save from your squash vines, the summer squash or your cucumbers when that one has gotten away and it's so huge, you're thinking, oh my goodness, I don't wanna eat this one anymore. But that doesn't mean you should take it off the vine and throw it away or compost it. Instead, leave it there. Wait for it to get nice and yellow, nice and big, and then you'll cut the middle of it open and those seeds are ripe and ready to save inside. I suppose you could try eating the flesh of that particular fruit, but um, no guarantee on what it's going to taste like because uh, the fruits that we have for market maturity, we want to pick when they're ripe. Tomatoes are one of the plants that you harvest. And when that tomato is fully ripe, those seeds are fully ripe as well. I don't know if any of you have left a tomato on your uh, counter for as long as I have, where the skin becomes a little bumpy and you wonder why the skin is getting bumpy. So you cut open the tomato to see what's inside and the seeds have actually sprouted inside of the tomato and there's little green leaflets the cotyledons are emerging from that little seed and they're like trying to poke up out of the tomato skin and i've done that as an example a couple of times and um yeah it's kind of fun so a tomato is actually just sort of ready to go you can plant it in the ground and you can get plants from it which is sort of neat but the tomato seeds are ripe when the tomato is ripe the cucumbers and the summer squash you want to wait for those plants to get just a little bit big and overripe and you wanna think, ooh, I don't wanna eat that anymore. That's when you're gonna to wanna to harvest your seeds from those plants. Next slide, please. So what are the traits that you wanna capture in those seeds that you're saving? Well, you might see an unusual color on a particular flower. So you're gonna to wanna to mark that particular flower um, and let that uh, flower uh, completely fulfill its cycle in in um, creating seeds, such as the left image here, the poppy, um, that poppy seed head that you can see has the flower seeds contained down inside. And the person that marked this one uh, thought that it was an unusual color of red and white, and perhaps those other blossoms were, were maybe pink. So they wanna see seeds from that and try and capture that red and white flower again. You also wanna rogue out bad seeds. So if you look at the image on the right, um, the beans, you can see there is a bad seed in that particular pod. It's white. It looks different than the other pods. So you 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 may want to just throw that one away or give it to the birds or put it in your compost and try and grow an experiment next year. So next slide, please. So I just showed you an example of wet seeds, the tomatoes and the cucumbers, and then I showed you dry seeds, the poppies and the beans. So they each need a little slightly different processing and it'll become really obvious as we go through this and you'll, you'll kind of understand, oh yes, this makes sense. So wet seeds, 
Wet seeds are seeds that are contained in a fruit that, well, is still moist. Eggplants, zucchinis are obviously much drier than a cucumber or a melon. Um, obviously, melons, and cucumbers, like for instance, kiwis, they're a much more aqueous plant. They have a lot higher moisture level in them than let's say an eggplant or a cucumber. But those are all considered to be wet seeds. And peppers aren't even really in the flesh of the fruit. They're contained right up next to the placenta in each individual pepper and not really intermixed at all. You can just brush them right off of that placenta once you cut the top off, very easy to harvest. However, they're moist. They've been in a moist environment. So wet seeds need to be processed to be able to be dried out. And how you do that is you simply remove them from, from um, their structure. Eggplants, it's really easy to do in a food processor. Put your plastic blade in versus your metal blade because we don't want eggplant seed pulp, we want eggplant seeds. So you'll go ahead and take your chopped up eggplant cubes of it and using that bread dough blade in your food processor, the plastic blade, you'll just mix it up into this sort of mucky kind of hummusy sort of a substance. And from there, you can put it into a strainer and start kind of rinsing away that pulp or into a bowl. The pulp floats to the top, you can pour it off. The seeds sink to the bottom of that, you know, container of water and you just keep doing that process. Many of us know this process from cleaning pumpkin seeds in the fall when we roast them for snacks after the pumpkins have been carved. It's really no different. It sounds complicated, but if you think about typical Halloween here in America, and how we clean our pumpkin seeds to roast, you know exactly how to clean a wet seed. So melons are no different than pumpkins. You just kind of remove that flesh from the seeds and you'll wanna dry them. Please make sure you label your seeds when you're saving them. Uh, you might become so excited about this that you get four or five seeds growing or, or you know, saving and uh, because you've gotten excited about it and, and you think, oh yeah, this is really easy. And then all of a sudden you've got four paper plates or four coffee filters or four cutting boards with your seeds drying on them and you've completely forgotten what they are. So you label them the way you need to with a piece of masking tape or write directly on your paper plate or coffee filter or you know, fold them between two sheets of newspaper and write on the top, however you need to label them. But it's really key that you label label those seeds. So those are, those are wet seeds. Um, the, the difference between, next slide please. The difference between cucumbers and tomatoes though, um, is that they require fermenting. So most wet seeds don't require fermenting. Cucumbers and tomatoes do. Um, you've bitten into a tomato before, or you've been chopping tomatoes and you lift them off your chopping board to put them into a bowl and there's that sort of um, viscousy, gelatinous um, substance that the seeds are caught in. We can't leave that on the seed because it sort of contaminates the seed coat and then the seeds are susceptible to molding or they'll have too many sugars. Animals might want to dig them up once they're planted. We need to remove that coating from the seeds on cucumbers and tomatoes. We do that through fermentation. Again, really simple. Think back to that image where the cucumber was split open. You scoop the seeds out of the, out of the cucumber or you'll slice your tomato open across the middle, across the equator of the tomato, and you just simply squeeze those seeds into a container. A glass jar works really well. You can, you can then eat the rest of, of, the, rest of the fruit um, if you want, it's perfectly fine. But the key to this is you really don't wanna add a lot of water. Um, you definitely don't wanna add any more than 50% water to these containers. This this sort of solution of seed and viscous material around the seed, this, this moist thing in the bottom of your jar might form mold on it in the next two days. You're gonna to wanna to leave it in your, on your counter for up to, up to four days. The summertime, when it's warm out, it takes a little less time to ferment your seeds completely than it does in the cooler days of fall. Um, but once, once they're fermented, they will clean themselves of all of that other, um, material that was surrounding them. You'll put some water in your jar, give them a swirl, the viable seeds sink to the bottom, the pulp and the, and the dead seeds or non-viable seeds float to the top and you just pour that off. You continue to rinse, filling your container with a little bit of water, swirling, dumping off the pulp and the dead seeds from the top until 
you're left with a bunch of clean seeds at the bottom of the jar, put them out onto your paper plate, newspaper, cutting board to dry. And um, that's, that's the fermentation process to get you to where the other moist seeds are. Next slide, please. Dry processing sometimes requires a screen. You can use a strainer. You can purchase expensive screens. Some screens are larger than other screens, and you'll find that if you're collecting things at Savers, Salvation Army, uh, garage sales, you know, remodeling your house, a big window frame, put over a wheelbarrow if you've got a lot of seeds to process, various screens really help to separate out all that chafe so that you can winnow, winnow that waste material away from the dry seeds. And even though the seeds are dry, sometimes it's always a good idea to let those seeds, after you've labeled them, just dry in a nice cool indoor location for a couple of weeks extra beyond when you've gotten them cleaned and labeled and let them sit out. And this is true even with the wet seeds. They're not gonna be dry for, you know, maybe sometimes a month before you're gonna seal them up into a container for storage. So most of your seeds, most of, most of your seeds are gonna be dry processed, all of your flowers, many of the foods that we eat. So it's only a few of the vegetables that are wet processed. Did you have something you wanted to add, Heidi? Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to let everyone know that this the library actually has, I believe, two sets of screens that you can check out. So if you're mm -hmm. uh, trying to do some dry seed processing and you're not sure how to go about it, though the sets of screens could be really helpful for you. Yeah, and those can actually be reserved online and you can pick them up at curbside pickup. So they're pretty great. They're really wonderful seed saving kits. I actually had to use them this last fall when I was there and we got some seed donations mm -hmm. that need to be cleaned. So yeah, we're hoping that if you donate seeds, they're already clean to save us from doing that. But the, the library does, does have um, the tools to do that. Next slide, please, Olivia. So this is a common example of um, a way to store seeds. And it's really, it's really anything goes. The key, if you're gonna be storing in something that's completely airtight, like glass or a plastic jar, is clearly those seeds need to be completely dry. We're looking at uh, moisture levels that are, are quite low, um, five to 10%. Sometimes when seeds drop below 5%, they're, the seeds get too dry and they can suffer damage, but any container will do. Here's an example in the lower right on that red stripe of towel. This is how I store my, my seeds. I use, I use the kinds of envelopes that I've gotten and I won't be resending out or I fold up pieces of paper. I think um, on the Seed Library website, we have the YouTube on how to make your own seed seed envelopes. And it's just a little folding origami paper exercise that's kind of fun. So in those dog days of summer when we're all sitting here like on a date like today, we can get out our piece of paper and make our own seed envelopes. But I think we can find that video on the Seed Library website. Um, so any way you wanna store your seeds is, is pretty much up to you. Um, the key is you wanna keep them cool, keep them in a dark place and keep them away from moisture because why? Because how do you germinate a seed? Well, just the opposite. You get them warm, you put them in the light, and you add moisture. So if we can take away those three factors, dark, dry, and cool, we can pretty much guarantee the seeds aren't gonna germinate and they're gonna stay safe. Next and I would question. also add um, that it's really important not only to label your seeds with the variety that it is, but also the date that you, were har that you harvested them. Because as you look back over the years, um, you need to know when you pull that seed packet out, how old the seeds are. If you've got three or four or five year old seed, when you're starting to grow it in the spring, you may consider adding a little extra seed because your viability may have gone down a little bit. So knowing the age is really helpful in knowing um, how well those seeds are gonna perform. Yeah, exactly. Another important factor to know is that we really would like you to use the donation forms that are at the library because they capture a lot more information, such as your name, your contact information, um, the Latin name or the botanical name of the plant, which is really what we want to use to identify a plant. Um, you know, who knows if you're eating butter and sugar or peaches and cream corn. Um, who knows if it's a muskmelon or a cantaloupe, those sort of common names we use interchangeably, and we need to know specifically what we're saving to be able to look up criteria 
um, so that the growers, the patrons who want to check out seeds from the seed library can, can have a pretty good idea of what they're growing. So Carrie, if you're on and listening, can you prepare a visual um, for us to see for at the end of this PowerPoint um, so we can see what a seed donation form looks like. And Heidi, we should maybe put that on future PowerPoints so that we can kind of show an example. And I don't know if that's available on the seed library website or not to download and print, and then you can bring it in with your seeds that you are uh, donating to the library, but it's really helpful. It's a pretty informative, in pretty informative form. So next slide, please, Olivia. So we also have directions at the seed library for how to make your own screen. Um, if you were interested in doing that, we have these kits available at the library um, when you participate in a seed saving workshop that we give out. Um, uh, and this is available on the seed savers website. It's kind of difficult to find. So we've got it here and I think everybody will get. I don't know if everybody can get a copy of this um, if you've attended today on how to make your own seed screen. Like I said, any kind of screen will do. And sometimes even a colander works if you're dealing with really large seeds uh, that won't even fall through a colander. So there's all kinds of ways to process and save your dry seeds. And then our next slide is our reference page, um, which has got a lot of uh, in information on it. Um, the photographs where we, um, where we pulled photographs from. Heidi and I pr produced a lot of the photographs on our own, but there's also some really helpful websites here as well. Uh, Carrie, if you're on, did you have enough time to find that uh, seed donation form or whoever else is on? I, I can't see specifically to see RPL seed library. There's two, two people that are on for that. Right. Um... Olivia and I are both on for that. Um, I'm going to try and find it. Do you need it right now or do you want to see it at the end? Here we are at the end. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> hold on just a second. I'm, I'm recording it. I'm not sure how to hold on. Are you still there? Yep. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how to share this. I'm not sure if Olivia has control or if I have control, so hold on. <laughs> so the seed library is pretty wonderful. Um, you all have an option to wave your hand uh, to the right of your name, if you've got the participant page open. So, how many of you have actually checked out seeds from the seed library? Can you wave your hand to show a show um, hands as to how many people have actually checked out checked out seeds from the seed library? I know I have. I have. I just can't find the wave the hand. Yeah, I don't okay. see it. Either. It's on the blue line by your name there. In the on the participant on the participant screen. Hello. Hello. Are we still here? Oh, we are still here. Okay, good. Is it sharing, Kelly? Yes, it is. You're you've got There's the donation form page up. Yep, there's the donation form, everybody. So you can see kind of the things that we're asking for this year. There's your name, the scientific name, which if you know it, that's great. Otherwise, sometimes we can we can find it if we have enough of the other information. The source, we'd love to know if you're saving seeds from our seed library seeds that you, you've actually checked out or if this is something you've just grown and you wanna share it with the community. I, for one, am going to be donating a lot of um, Flanders field poppies this year. <laughs> Um, I have a proliferation of them in my yard, and these are the actual heirloom Flanders poppies that were grown in on Flanders Field, World War One, um, during um, that that Flanders battle. So, kind of a kind of a special poppy. Uh, we just celebrated kind of the ending of World War One two years ago. So they're and they're in exquisite poppies. I've never seen anything quite so delicate before, and they just grew so easily. So I thought they'd be a nice addition to the flowers in our library. 
Um, so then the other thing I got to get close here because I can't see. Um, yeah, if, if you didn't get them from the seed library, you're going, you, if you could list the source and obviously they need to be open pollinated seeds. Um, the location and date of harvest, like Heidi mentioned, put your year on there. The, the, the month isn't, you know, particularly important, but the year, the year is important. And if you've got a special story, we're working on some other ideas with the seed library to share seed stories. And we've been posting some pretty neat stories on the Facebook page. So we'd love to know a special story. If you've got 1, um, for instance, like the Flanders poppy story that I just shared with you. Um, your donor name, which is uh, optional, you can certainly remain remain anonymous if you like your email again is optional. And then, um, if you have any garden photos, obviously, we, we will contact you about that. If your story is uh, kind of creative and we can post that on the Facebook page. Do you have anything more you want to add Carrie or Heidi? And do we have any questions, Olivia? Yes, uh, we don't have any questions in the chat right now, but it is not too late for you guys. If there's anything you wanted to ask about, um, or if you wanted to either unmute and turn on video and ask your questions in person, it's totally up to you. We have some time left in our program and we can also end early if you don't have any questions, but um, I'm sure Heidi and Kelly would love to hear them. If you have any, um, or if you had any comments about your experience seed saving in the past, uh, we'd love to hear it. So. Uh, let us know in the chat or go ahead and uh, turn on your video, but thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm sending a survey in the chat right now. If you guys could take that and copy it into your browser to tell us how we're doing in our programming, virtual programming. Um, and if you're interested in asking some more general gardening Q&A, there are drop in Q&A hours on this coming Saturday, August 1st at 1 p.m. through 3 p.m. And you can find the WebEx information online where you found the information about this program. We have a question in the chat. Um, what about saving flower seeds? Yeah, yeah, flower seeds are awesome to save. Um, like I said, the, the Flanders poppies that I grew this year are from um, saved seeds, funny story. I asked my mother, who's sort of a seed package collector, um, and they're they're sort of dispersed in various places around her house. She finally just gave me all of her seeds, um, which is dating back to 1994. So I didn't worry about where they were going to come up. I had my son open all the packages, throw them into a bowl. We mixed them all up, raked them into this five by 20 foot area, and this is where I got some really lovely flowers this year. Pretty pretty incredible things. I wish I would have known which seeds those were that produced those flowers, but I've been able to kind of go back and understand that. But saving seeds for flowers is really wonderful. And like I had mentioned during the presentation, those are all going to be dry seeds. There aren't any wet flower seeds that you're gonna be saving. They will all be dry. So you'll be using screens for that, or like in the case of the poppies, they just dump right out of that capsule and there they are, little black poppy seeds. Um, so flower seed saving is generally easier than um, saving from saving from um, wet wet seed wet seed vegetables. And I would just add that um, flower seed saving is is really interesting because there are so many different kinds of flower shapes, sizes, and forms, and so um, sometimes it's not really obvious. Uh, where the seeds are or what the seeds look like. So you may need to do a little bit of research um, to understand what it is you're actually looking for when you have a dried up flower head. So um, if you are interested in saving seed from your flowers, then you wouldn't want to deadhead everything. So, you know, that's a common practice um, among flower gardeners is they're constantly deadheading, taking off the dead or spent flowers so that the plant will continue to produce beautiful flowers. Um, which is great, but you do need to leave some of those dead flowers or drying flowers on the plant in order to get seed harvest. And also remember that um, seeds are formed over time. So you can't wait until the very end of the season. You're gonna actually need to start saving some of those or leaving some of those flowers on the plants, you know, by mid season. So they have plenty of time to fully mature and fully dry. So those seeds are viable. But I would say just try some things, just experiment. I mean, I'm learning all the time as I grow flowers in my yard. Um, 
when are the seeds ready? Where do I find them? How do I get them out of the flower? Um, it's just a lot of fun to learn that on a kind of trial and error basis. Do we have any more questions from the audience? We got to think that was helpful. So thank you. Um, welcome. Thank you for the question. I'm also going to plug our um, seed library site that I started sharing earlier. I'll see if I can share that again. That um, Heidi and Kelly and uh, many of our other partners have also um, contributed to just a second. Lots of really good links. So the menu for WebEx keeps popping up as I'm trying to hit. There we go. Is that sharing now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if you are rplmn.org and um, forward slash seed, you can see our seed library page. Um, it, Olivia shared a survey earlier that was just about programming. Um, so you can give us feedback about the virtual program today and if you attended one last week. But also we have a seed survey up on the website that if you want to give us feedback about the seed library itself, we'd really appreciate um, if you want to provide some information um, and feedback for it. And then there's also a place in it that you can provide if you'd like um, to be contacted and be willing to talk to us further about it so we can ask you more than just a seven question survey. We'd, we'd be really interested in feedback about the seed library, what we're doing well and what we can improve upon. But um, down at the bottom of the page, you can find um, really great videos for seed starting from uh, Minnesota Extension and a seed saving workshop we had last year with a printable list of resources. Um, and we had some other, we had some other videos. You do, they're in the left right there in that box. I have so, to go. Yep, yep, go up. Okay, there it's we right go. There in that box, yep. We have the MSHS Resource Hub with all sorts of really great videos and links to other things too. We have um, North Circle Seeds, Seed Saving Video as well. Uh, I don't see the, um, the YouTube on making your own envelope, so I'm going to have to send you that link. I yeah, if you could send that, we'll get it up. Yeah, okay. It's kind of a, it's just a quick little one to fold your own little envelope. So MSHS is the Minnesota State Horticultural Society. They have lots of great resources there. Do we have a, a bulk link for University of Minnesota Extension uh, Yard and Garden in there? The What's Killing My Kale podcast is pretty great to understand. Um, we've been having a lot of issues this year with um, a lot of male flowers on squash plants not producing, not producing fruit. And um, there's some great information on a podcast for that, What's Killing My Kale. Um, it's generally due to the fact that we got hot so quickly in the year and the, the plants got a little fooled, it also can have something to do with um, nutrient nutrient loss in the soil. I gotta stop sharing. <laughs> Bottom line is that there's uh, the seed library website is just a, a great source of information. And um, this this program, this recorded program will be listed there as well as the one from last week, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, um, and there's lots of handouts um, as well. So I would definitely check that out. Um, and of course, there are great resources at the library that you can get through curbside pickup um, if you're interested in books. And also there are seeds yet available. Um, I don't know, you know, we did a, a program last weekend on late season gardening. So if you're wanting to perhaps throw some things in the ground yet this year, you could check that out and get some seeds. Uh, but also, if you just want to get some seeds this year and have them ready for next year and maybe avoid the rush in the spring, um, you could do that as well. Next week, we have coming up on Saturday, August 1st, um, like uh, Olivia said, or maybe it was Carrie, somebody said it, from 1 to 3, we're going to be asking live questions, Q&A, so you can call in at any time. 
Um, and we'll be answering questions if you have any problems with your plans or need some advice. Um, if we don't have any more lingering audience questions, we'll go ahead and let you guys continue with your afternoon. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we go? If not, uh, you're welcome to take them to the Q&A session next, this coming Saturday, if you think of anything. But we thank you so much, both Heidi and Kelly, for presenting today and for our audience for taking the time to learn more about seed saving. And we hope that you look forward to our upcoming program and stay connected with the seed library online and check out our website and the surveys that we're working on to help make both these programs in this library even better. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, do we have any last remarks from anybody before we go? No, thank you, Maria. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Happy everyone. Gardening. Happy gardening. <laughs>